Today's discipleship activity, our, our discipline, we're going to call it Bible study, um, as opposed to reading through the Bible, as opposed to memorizing passages of Scripture. This is another unique discipline that uh, is distinct and separate from those first two disciplines. The idea of Bible study is to slow down, to make observations, to take time as you go through the scriptures to ask questions, to cultivate wonder, um, to seek answers to those questions. So if you were concerned that maybe in reading through the Bible you're reading too, through too fast and missing stuff, well don't worry, this is a different type of activity where you slow down and pay attention and try to dig in and unearth, dig in and unearth new things. So big picture, the hope of studying is that you can actually get into the, the mind and the spirit of the writer and the author, that you can see their, their train of thought and their line of thinking. Um, it's the ability to start to make connections between what one author said and another author said, or one book of the scripture and another book of the scripture. Even to start to find and draw connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that you begin to see this web of connections in the scriptures, which we know is there from the very fact that Jesus' name is the Logos. He's the one who holds all things together, so that we believe that all throughout the scriptures there are connections to be discovered and unearthed and enjoyed. Awe, or I should say wonder, is a huge part of Bible study. If you don't have good questions, you're not going to find good answers. So even though you might not get immediate answers to all of your questions, the goal of Bible study is to make observations and to notice things that elicit wonder that we can put before God and we can ask him questions or we can search the text and look for answers to our questions. But wonder is the, is the fuel and the supply of Bible study as we cultivate and develop that, we get good questions which fuel our energies to search for good answers. Ultimately, the goal is to come up with what I would call like the BGT or the Bill Gooker translation or your name, to, to come up with your translation. You want to take the words that somebody else wrote, understand them well enough that then you begin to speak them in your own words and in your own language. And that doesn't mean that you're writing your own Bible. It just means that when someone says, well, why do you say it that way? That you've studied it enough and you have enough reasons that you can go back to the original text and say, see, this is why I'm saying it the way I'm saying it. This is what I see. This is what I observe. This is what I understand. Because it becomes powerful when we study the scriptures enough that they become internal to us, that they begin to be uh, communicated in our own language, in our own metaphors, in our own pictures. And those two things work in harmony, right? I don't want to be independent of what the scriptures actually say, uh, and vice versa. I don't just want to be reading the, pa the, the, the letters off the page without understanding. I want these two things to come together, um, the Word of God and, my sp and, and the Spirit within me uh, forming understanding and communication. Let's take a second and talk about the opposition or the things that get in the way of true wonder and Bible study. Um, one of them is, and I don't, don't take this too extreme, is commentaries actually can be a very big hindrance. Um, commentaries are when somebody else puts their comments and their understanding and their interpretation around the scriptures. And I, they can be helpful. I, I just want to downplay them in that what happens is, is when we mistake commentaries and Bible study, then we let somebody else do the work for us and we think that we've studied and really what we're doing is learning to parrot or regurgitate what somebody else observed and saw. So I'm not saying there's never a place and never a time but when it comes to actual Bible study I, I, my personal belief is to leave commentaries out of it entirely. To actually do the work ourselves to spend time making observations and taking notes and, and noticing things and praying and asking the Lord for revelation. Um, in a way, it's kind of like getting the cliff notes or watching the movie versus reading the book, right? We want to be in there studying firsthand and then later on maybe we confirm it and see what somebody else saw, but we don't want that to be driving our study. I suppose that's maybe tied to the, the big obstacle to Bible study is just apathy. You know, when we don't have wonder, we don't have questions. When we don't have inquiry, we're not really compelled to seek. And that's something that we can maybe pray for and ask the Lord, give me a sense of awe, give me a sense of wonder, 
make me hungry, make me thirsty. But when that starts to become a cycle, when you just become more regularly thirsty and you're around thirsty people who ask good questions and it makes you more thirsty and makes you ask better questions. And so it's a discipline that again is done best in a group of people as we spur one another on to love and good works, as we spur one another on to better questions, as we strive together to answer those questions. Um, that really builds that discipline of, of study. And again, it's to end up with understanding, it's to end up with reasons for your understanding and being able to communicate the, the, the scriptures in your own words. All right, so what do we do with Bible study? What are, what are the mechanics of it? What does it look like? Um, I think there's some other videos that I did out there that maybe get into this in more detail. Um, and again, I don't want to do all the detail in this video, but the idea is there's some tools out there. Um, Chris Pollock, he's a brother. If you know him, ask him. If not, talk to someone I know who might know him, and he can point you to a tool that he made called a manuscript maker. Fantastic to get rid of all the, the distractions of numbers and chapters, uh, to be able to like look at the Bible without all these, um, without all the, the, the documentation on it. Uh, there's text analyzers that you can find online to look for repeating words. Probably my favorite tool is called the Blue Letter Bible app. Uh, it lets you just read through the scriptures on your phone and it lets you just kind of click and look up root words and Greek words and search for words and search for phrases. Just great little tools that help us to um, dig deeper into what we're reading and to um, to just peel back the surface and, and, and look a little deeper. One piece of study that I think is just really valuable is looking at the original Greek and Hebrew words. Uh, so if you have your Blue Letter Bible, I love sitting there during preaching and having it open and just digging while people are talking, um, investigating the scriptures. I love to look up the root words. And if you just do that regularly and make it a habit while you're reading, while you're studying, while you're listening, after a while, it's funny, you actually start to become familiar with the different words and what they mean and the nuances, and it'll give you deeper insight to the, to the scriptures, and sometimes it even helps you make connections between um, various books of the Bible, various passages of scripture. Now, as a discipline, as a work, I like to print out books of the Bible, short or long, uh, and then at, read through them dividing and just putting like slashes uh, where I see breaks in thought, changes of thought, changes in ideas. And so then after I kind of break it down and try to capture every idea, then I'll narrate in the margin on the side and just write down what, what's the main idea of that passage, what's the main idea of that section, and try to capture each thought and, and write it in my own words. Then after I've captured uh, those thoughts and I have this flow of, of different ideas, then I'll go through and I'll look for words that are repeated words that are emphasized, um, dig deeper into, into, into the meaning of those words. And so, um, you know, I'll take highlighters and I'll highlight the same word over and over again. Look, the word love appears 15 times, you know, or, oh, wow, there's a strange word, propitiation, what's that? And I'll look it up and define it. And so that just helps me get richer in my understanding of the text. So first break it up into ideas, then examine the little nitty gritty details. And I can't even describe for you what the Holy Spirit will do as you just do that exercise, things will pop out, things that will engage you and create awe and create wonder and create conversation. Remember, that's the goal of Bible study. Then after I've dug in and defined words and pulled out these little nitty gritty details, what I'll try to do is bring it all together and try to retell the message or retell the storyline in my own words. Um, and you know, again, that's so you start from what's being said and making observations, digging into the details, and then trying to express it in my own language and in my own words. And again, that whole process from start to finish of, of eating and digesting and then regurgitating, um, that's ultimately when someone else does a commentary, what they've done, or when someone else preaches a message, what they've done. You're eating the milk, right? Someone else ate, digested, produced milk, and served it to you. What we're talking about here is the discipline and the exercise of eating the meat for yourself so that you can turn it into milk for others. I want to leave you with a piece of encouragement and say, take risks in your Bible study. I mean, really stretch. Don't try to be conservative and to say and see things exactly the way other people have said it before you. Like That's the, the safe reason why people use commentaries as well. This guy said it and he was published, so if I say what he said, I'm safe. Take risks, all right? And, I'm, and I'm, this isn't because doctrine is not 
important. It's because doctrine is very important that we don't want to just get into a rut and trust that in conversation you will be shaped, you will be corrected, you'll be informed, and you'll exchange better things. But to do the work to explore for yourself firsthand and maybe even be wrong is fine. It's just, it's you engaging with the Lord in the scriptures that that is the, the key. Um, so take risk, speak what you're seeing, and allow people to speak back to you and to interact with you about the observations you're making. Trust the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is promised, he is given to you to lead you into all truth, to guide you into all truth. Trust that he will do what he's going to do. Put your faith in the Holy Spirit to guide you into the truth, and then relax a little bit and enjoy the awe, enjoy the wonder, enjoy the exploration, enjoy the investigation, enjoy the Lord. That's the whole goal of these disciplines, right? Is to enjoy the Lord and to, to grow up into him, to stretch those muscles, to work out, to learn to eat meat, to learn to serve others milk. So quick summary. Treat the different books differently, right? I mean, there's, there's gospels, there's epistles, there's narratives, there's poetry, there's wisdom literature. You can really apply this to any of the books, you know, just divide them up into thoughts and concepts and movements. Um, treat it like literature, figure out the, the plot, the main idea, the themes, things like that. Um, discover the flow and the emphasis and the repetitions. Just pick these books apart. Epistles are the easiest place to start, so maybe start with the epistles, and then, you know, then maybe move to the Gospels and Old Testament. You know, just have fun with it, enjoy it, slow down, pay attention, try to break down the thoughts. Remember that over time, you're going to learn to be able to tell these stories in your own language, to speak them in your own um, in your own words. Uh, you're going to be able to make connections as you get experience with this, as you slow down and do it more and more. You'll make connections between different New Testament books. You'll make connections between New Testament ideas and Old Testament ideas. And again, you'll enjoy discovering the Logos, right? The Jesus, the Word who holds all things together, who is at the center of the scriptures and fueling his gospel is is tying all these things together and the more we begin to see that the more we begin to to worship and to just be in awe and lastly if you want to stay engaged in study then i recommend stay engaged in conversation get with some people who like to talk about these things do it together as a team whenever it's possible so that you're comparing your observations comparing your notes talking about these things that creates the fuel to, to keep going. Doing it by yourself is fine, especially if you have the self-discipline, but doing it together, a cord of three is not easily broken. It, it generates its own energy. The best part about being in conversation is that people are gonna ask you why you see it that way. How did you come to that conclusion? What did you see? And it's healthy. It provokes us to, to speak our thoughts and to, to, to retell our observations. And so be prepared as you study to engage in conversation and to help others see how you came to those conclusions. Uh, you want to be able to share those observations with others. Okay, I know that Bible study is a huge topic and we could explore it uh, ad nauseum, but I just want to put that out there as a discipline, encourage you to make the effort to not just read, not just memorize, but to break the scriptures apart and look at them more detailed, slow down as you walk through the vineyard of the text. Uh, I just, I want to encourage you to make that a separate and distinct discipline in your discipleship.